By the time we've reached the lower Pleistocene, we very quickly begin to get hominins far beyond the early origins in Africa. By 1.8 million years ago, we've got hominins in Dibinisi, Georgia. Shortly after that, we have evidence of fossil record in Southeast Asia, in the island of Java in Indonesia. Current evidence suggests that by about 1.7 million years ago, we had fossils, or at least archaeological evidence of humans, in the Niwan Basin of northwestern China. By about 1.4 million years ago, we've got evidence of hominins in Spain and southern Europe. All of these suggest that hominins very rapidly began to expand into different environments with the origin of the genus Homo. It also means that our understanding or the context in which we need to think about natural selection happening within the human species begins to change. As hominins begin to occupy a broader geographic range, they begin to move into more and more different habitats. The actions of climate change and the climate patterns, such as seasonality, would begin to affect hominins differently in different populations in different parts of the world. We also are talking about an expanse of time in which there's a lot of cyclical change in terms of Pleistocene climate. Periods that are colder, where we see the development of increasing glaciation in the Northern Hemisphere, ice ages, and also periods that are warmer, perhaps even as warm as it is today. So there's a lot of geographic and climatic variation throughout Pleistocene human evolution. Now when we think about this, we can also think about what were humans doing within these environments. Because while it's possible that natural selection might begin to select for different characteristics in different populations in different parts of the world, given the differing climatic or environmental regimes they experienced, we also need to begin thinking about human behavior. What role does human behavior play in local adaptation to local climatic conditions? This existence, the life of a hunter-gatherer, was what our ancestors were doing for close to at least two million years from the time they first started butchering animals some two and a half million years ago, up until the development of agriculture only within the last 10,000 years. So it's important to understand what it means to be a hunter-gatherer. Now in addition to simply foraging all the food from the local environment, there are a number of key attributes to hunter-gatherer populations that we can think about. One of the first is that their population size is small. If you're dependent on the local environment to provide everything you need to survive, your ability to sustain a population is dependent on what technology allows you to get out of that environment. The kind of technology we see in Pleistocene human populations, basic old wand tools, core stones and flakes, eventually more developed tools like Acheleen stone tools, give us a sense of the kind of technological constraints that would have existed on how much food, how much nutrition essentially, populations could have gotten out of their local environment. So hunter-gatherer populations would be small because they'd be constrained in terms of the nutrients they could get out of their local environment. In addition to being small, these populations would have likely been fairly dispersed. While the population a local environment can support is fairly small, the geographic area needed to support that population is probably fairly large. Hunter-gatherer populations that exist in contemporary times roam across vast areas, much larger areas than we tend to occupy in our daily lives these days, which suggests that hunter-gatherer populations in the Paleolithic also would have occupied fairly large geographic ranges, covering a substantial amount of ground, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but season to season or even year to year. So populations would have been small and they would have been dispersed. This gives us an important background with which to understand the kinds of patterns of variation we might expect to see. Populations that were small and dispersed might have been subject to significant amounts of genetic drift. Local extinction, the loss basically of a local population or a set of local populations across a region, may also have been common throughout the Pleistocene. If we think again about this pattern of climatic change affecting small dispersed populations of hunter-gatherers, if there was a significant climatic change within one region, say an ice age affecting parts of southern Europe, or a dry season affecting big areas of southern Africa, that may have led to substantial regional population extinction occurring periodically throughout the Pleistocene. When we think about Pleistocene human evolution then, we need to couple these two factors together. We have populations scattered across a broad geographic range, subject to different local and regional climatic regimes. They would have been highly dependent on these local environments to sustain small dispersed populations of hunter-gatherers. And yet they weren't entirely vulnerable. One of the interesting things about Pleistocene human evolution is that they were cultural organisms. They had an expanding brain. This evidence for encephalization meant they had behavioral capabilities to behaviorally adjust to changes in the environment. So in thinking about integrating the archaeological record with the fossil record, thinking about it in terms of a human population genetics perspective, this is one of the challenges and one of the truly unique things about studying human evolution, is that humans were adaptable not just through genetic change, not just through evolving new mutations that might have provided some new advantageous condition to deal with new evolving environmental conditions, but humans can change through their behaviors. 
they can change through different technologies. They can make different tools. They can use those tools in different ways. So the complexity that's possible in the context of human evolution, the complexity that allowed for humans to occupy all these different environments in the first place, is one of the factors we need to keep in mind.